Uh, we'll kick it off today with an amazing panel on fiduciary obligations, where we will have uh, Jill Fish, Ann Lipton, Darren Rosenblum, and uh, Bernard Scharfman. Um, I just want to uh, say a few things about uh, each one of our amazing panelists. Um, we'll start with Jill Fish. Uh, professor Fish is a uh, professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Cary Law School. She, she's an internationally known scholar whose work focuses on uh, the intersection of business and law, including the role of regulation and litigation in addressing limitations uh, mm -hmm. in the disciplinary power um, and the capital markets. She's written uh, more than 70 scholarly articles that have appeared in top law reviews, including Harvard Law Review, uh, the Yale Law Journal, and the University of Pennsylvania Law Review. Her current projects include experimental research into retail investor decision making, analysis of the structural and practical challenges posed by the financial regulatory pro uh, process, and ongoing work on the theory and goals of a private securities fraud litigation. Um, Professor Fish has also explored uh, the role of institutional investors in corporate governance, particularly shareholder voting. Uh, she traveled extensively in Europe and Asia to teach and to lecture and to meet with scholars and regulators on issues involving corporate uh, governance. Um, she received the LM Award uh, for Excellence in Teaching and the Robert A. Gorman Award for Excellence in Teaching. And she's the director of the European Corporate Governance Institute, a member of the American Law Institute and a former chair of the Committee on Corporate Law of the Association of the uh, Bar of the City of New York. She's also a member of the National Adjudicatory um, Council of the Financial Industry Regulation Authority. Um, so without further ado, I think that uh, Professor Fish is our first panelist. <clears throat> okay, I see that. Um, just a second. Okay, let's actually start then with um, Professor Ann Lipton. Professor Ann Lipton is uh, an experienced securities and corporate litigator who has handled class actions involving some of the world's largest companies. She joined the Tulane Law Faculty in 2015 after two years as a visiting professor at Duke University School of Law. In 2016, she was named as Tulane's first um, Michael M. Fleischmann Associate Professor in Business Law and Entrepreneurship. Professor Lipton clerked for the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Justice David Souter, and the third U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge Edward Becker, before handling securities and corporate litigation at the trial and appellate level at the firms in New York City. He also worked briefly for the Securities and Exchange Commission. As a scholar, Professor Lipton explores corporate governance, the relationships between corporations and investors, and the role of corporations in society. Her articles... Um, have appeared in the Journal of Corporation Law, the, For the Fordham Law Review, and the Georgetown Law Journal, uh, among other publications. Beginning with the ninth edition, she will be one of the authors of uh, the Securities Regulation Cases and Materials Case book published by Aspen Publishers. Um, I have to say I'm a huge fan of her blogs. She blogs regularly for the Business Law Prof blog, and she's very active on Twitter. Uh, so without further ado, Professor Lipton. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and and uh, 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 Professor Fish is here if you want to, <laughs> or if, you, if that was your original order, but I'm happy to. <laughs> um, it's up to you, Professor Jill or Professor uh, Lipton. It's up to you. What would you like to do? What, do, uh, do you want me to start? It's up to you. It's up to you too. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Um, so we just no. thank you and thank you. By the way, Professor Fish is one of my mentors. She's an amazing scholar. I love her work. And I just gave the audience um, a long introduction of your bio, which is amazing. And by the way, she wrote over 90 law review articles. 
Uh, Professor Fish, thank you, please, the stage is yours. Anat, thank you. And I'm glad that I missed your introduction because then I'm not embarrassed by it. So <laughs> um, hang on, let me just uh, get the uh, get my slides up here. So um, I think this is the right screen. Can you see my slides? Um, I saw that you started sharing the screen. It says, it says slide sharing is paused. I don't know why it did that. Let me just ask uh, Martin. Yes. Okay. Great. Now can you see them? Yes. Perfect. Great. Okay. So um, thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I guess if I'm starting things off, I should try to set the stage for our discussion. So let me see if I can do that. Um, our panel is uh, entitled Fiduciary Obligations of Index Fund Managers. Um, and I guess what I'm going, going to focus on, and I'm gonna try and raise a couple of themes that maybe will help overall for today's discussion is some practical questions that are uh, sort of implicated by the fact that fund managers are fiduciaries um, they're fiduciaries to the uh, funds that they manage. Uh, arguably, they're fiduciaries to the investors who invest in those funds. And I'm going to talk about why that difference matters. And um, they may also have obligations, and increasingly we're thinking about their obligations, to the companies in which they invest, to their portfolio companies. So, um, and the reason we're increasingly thinking about this third role, and technically it's not a fiduciary role, um, but we uh, are globally, we're thinking a lot about institutional investor stewardship. The idea that asset managers, index fund managers and other um, institutional investors should engage and vote to influence positively the assets in which they invest. And, um, uh, we see this, as I said, globally. We see this in many countries like the UK framed as an affirmative obligation. Um, and we also see a lot of academic commentary saying with respect to their portfolio companies, institutional investors aren't doing enough, right? Either they're not engaged enough or they're not taking their votes seriously enough or they're not engaging on a broad enough range of issues. This particularly comes up with respect to ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues. And I know there's a later panel that will focus on that. Um, but these questions have been increasingly raised. And institutions are taking these questions seriously and trying to think about, okay, how can we do more? But they have to do this in the US in the context of their obligations to their funds and to the investors in those funds. And as I said, this can create some tensions, right? So the focus of this panel and this program is index funds, right? So here's our, our you know, little picture and our little definition of index funds. But what, what is key about index funds? Three things. Number one, they hold a lot of companies, right? It's not like a hedge fund that's engaged in eight or 10 or 12 companies at a time. They hold hundreds of companies in their portfolios. They invest in those companies because the companies are included in an index. So they don't do firm specific research. They don't decide this is a good company. This is a bad company. They just invest. And three, they compete largely on costs. So they try to manage their portfolios in a very low cost way. Right? So these uh, attributes create potential risks, right? And these risks are associated with institutional investor st stewardship, right? There's a risk that they'll make mistakes. They don't do firm specific re research. They could get it wrong. They could propose something that's just wrong for the company. And people have raised this as is a particular concern when we're talking about transactions, right? A merger or something like that. Um, they could, and some commentators have actually suggested that they should sacrifice firm specific value in favor of portfolio value. So Madison Condon has taken that view. Jeff Gordon has a recent draft uh, basically saying, well, it doesn't matter what happens at Exxon, if Exxon, you know, it, it doesn't matter if this uh, proposal hurts Exxon, if it benefits all of the other companies in the portfolio, that's something the index fund should do. Um, there's a risk that they'll sacrifice economic value in favor of non-pecuniary goals. 
um, doing something because it's the right thing, even if it costs the firm, even if it costs investors money. And there's a risk that they may uh, be subject to agency costs, that they may act to further interests of the fund managers, of the head of the company that aren't shared by their investors. It also creates complexities. Which in interests should the index fund prioritize? How should it figure out what its investors' interests are? And what if the investors in the funds have different priorities? How does an index fund navigate that? So here's a, just a picture on sort of the complexity of priorities, right? These days, everything is on the table. So when we talk about investors, uh, investor stewardship, we say investors should deal with climate change, they should promote supply chain compliance issues, they should uh, deal with uh, diversity in the workplace, they should um, uh, deal with wealth and income inequality, right? The list goes on, too many things even to put on the slide, right? So how do we figure out what the uh, fund should pay attention to? And how do we figure that, that out in particular in an index fund, right? Index funds are part of an overall fund complex. Should the fund complex manage its index funds differently from its other funds? Um, do we pay attention at the fund level or do we recognize that index fund investors may also hold other funds? Um, is the relevant interest the interest of the investors or the fund itself? A fund is just a a portfolio of assets, just, right? It's just a pile of stock and bonds and maybe some cash, right? It doesn't have any interests of its own. Um, and the complexity is enhanced by the fact that of the hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of investors in a single fund, they don't all want the same thing. So you might have some socially engaged investors. People say millennials are more concerned with things like climate change. And you have, might have some retirees who are depending on that fund for their daily living expenses. And if the fund takes a hit, you know, they're going to eat pet food or something. So um, how is a fund supposed to take into account, well, you know, half of my investors want something and half want something else. And people have talked about, well, you can solve this through pass-through voting. But at the end of the day, it's a little unsatisfying to think of a fund splitting its vote, right? So, you know, one possibility is pass-through voting. Another possibility is communicating, either communicating from the fund to the investor, this is what we intend to do, right? If you don't like it, don't buy our fund. Um, communicating from the investors to the fund, these are our preferences, this is what we want you to do. I've got a paper, uh, experimental paper that I'm working on with Sean Griffith and Abby Marcus in which we're trying to figure out whether investors would like that kind of an option. And a final uh, possibility is market segmentation through fund specialization. And I'll talk a little bit more about several of these, right? So pass through voting, great. We can figure out what the investors want by just giving them their vote. Um, but it's not entirely clear how manageable this process is. Certainly pass through voting, the idea has been around for years and with technology, with blockchain, it's a lot more feasible. But mutual fund investors in particular don't vote very often, right? Most of the things they just throw in the garbage. It's not clear how sophisticated they are. A lot of mutual funds are held by people in their 401k plans. And research shows that 401k only investors are particularly weak in things like uh, financial literacy. Again, it doesn't solve the problem of heterogeneous investor preferences. And it reduces the power of the fund or the fund complex to advocate for change. Because it can't say to the company, if you do what we want, we'll vote your way. Um, it's the voting is up to the individual shareholders, right? So other possibilities are communication and delegation, but this raises the issue of trade-offs and how the fund manager is supposed to navigate those trade-offs. The advantages of going through a centralized system is you take advantage of the fund manager's sophistication and expertise, and you use the heft of the index fund to support not just its own initiatives, but initiatives that may have been identified by activist hedge funds, actively managed funds within the fund complex or fund managers. So those are advantages, right? Now, the uh, final possibility that I want to flag for today is can we do this through greater specialization, right? And in particular, 
if you look at ESG mutual funds, the market is exploding, and this includes ESG index funds. But we have funds that employ exclusionary strategies. We have funds that provide engagement. We have impact funds. We have thematic funds, um, all these different uh, possibilities. The range of options is increasing, and the disclosure about these differences is increasing. So this provides a potential, we're not there yet, but a potential solution that I think we could work a lot harder to um, move along. And it's a way of meeting the fiduciary obligations of fund managers by essentially having them explain what they intend to deliver and then holding them accountable for what they've promised, not for saving all of society's uh, uh, myriad problems. Right? The keys are greater transparency, what the funds are doing, and greater accountability. So brokers, employers who select the funds in a 401k plan, rating organizations, and the financial media are all tools that we can use to hold the funds accountable. Is the fund really doing what it claims to be doing? And with those kinds of vehicles, I think we have a market mechanism that's a very promising substitute for more aggressive regulation, regulation along the lines of, for example, uh, what the Department of Labor is doing in the area of pension funds. Right? So um, what does this market segmentation have to do with the classic index fund? Right? What I'm identifying is alternatives, not necessarily saying, well, gee, yeah, you can have an index fund that actively engaged and is thematic and all of that stuff. That might be pretty hard. But I think this still leaves room and narrower space for traditional index funds to be effective, consistent with their fiduciary obligations. So one thing that they can do is promote increased disclosure. Jeff Gordon, as I said, has a new paper in which he's talking about this. I worry a little bit about index funds mobilizing beyond disclosure. I will grant you it's a low cost strategy. In general, right, subject to some qualifications, we think, well, disclosures, you know, uh, pretty good thing, right? Firm specific, company level disclosure, disclose your plans to address climate change or something like that. But I'm not sure that disclosure at the fund level is a viable solution to societal problems. If something really is economically significant, it seems to me it should be, be mandated disclosure for all firms, or at least all publicly traded firms, and it shouldn't be left to the shareholder proposal process. Second option, strengthening the economic claim for particular initiatives. So if index funds drawing on their research, drawing on the research of their sponsor and the actively managed funds in their complex say, you know, climate change isn't just a feel good thing. It's something that matters for portfolio companies. It's something that's going to affect your bottom line. Making that case and putting the voting power behind that can be quite compelling, can sort of nudge um, uh, intransigent management to take issues that they perhaps hadn't realized had become economically and societally important, taking those issues more seriously, right? But this only works if index funds limit themselves to issues that are economically significant, right? Third possibility, support for creative activism. So Ron Gilson and Jeff Gordon have this um, uh, article in the Columbia Law Review about um, uh, institutional investors, index funds kind of mediating traditional hedge fund activism. Hedge funds come up with an operational change, index funds support them if they think it's a good idea. This is a way of kind of vetting the proposal. Passive funds can do the same thing with respect to so-called sustainability activism. So there are a handful of hedge funds today that are saying, you know, there are economic, there is economic value that can be achieved through funds, through um, portfolio companies behaving better, through portfolio companies dealing with environmental, social governance questions. When a hedge fund brings that kind of initiative, I think there's real value in the index fund saying, look, do we believe it? Does this matter? And if we do, and we support you, the hedge fund's more likely to succeed. So all of these, I think, are within the mainstream of index fund engagement, are low cost strategies, don't require the firm specific knowledge that index funds are ill equipped to uh, obtain. 
and nonetheless promote firm economic value and firm social value at the same time. So that's my introduction and uh, let me pass the baton and stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Fish. What we will do now is I would like to take some questions from the audience and for, uh, from the panelists. And I'll second in uh, checking out the Q&A. So uh, if that's okay, I'll take the liberty of asking the first question. Um, so what do you think about, you know, this movement that we're seeing around the world, right? There's this uh, 21st movement towards extension of fiduciary duties in countries outside the United States. Um, what they're doing is that um, they're extending fiduciary duties and especially with regards to institutional investors, um, um, you know, they're asking them to take ESG into account and other things. What do you think about that? Do you think it might happen in the United States or we're still, you know, very far from that? And, and I'm just gonna say one more thing. I'm gonna remind the attendees, please ask me questions in the Q&A faction, okay? For me to be able to read them, it has to be in the Q&A function. Thank you. Well, Anat, it, it's a great question. Um, I think we wanna be careful about calling this fiduciary duties. So that's why I framed my talk in terms of stewardship, right? US style fiduciary duties are an anomaly, right? And they're an anomaly because there's a uh, level of liability exposure, litigation exposure that really isn't present in the rest of the world. And so when we talk about these stewardship obligations, right, the language in these stewardship codes, you're right, you know, it's, it's pretty aggressive. But by and large, what the codes are requiring institutional investors to do is disclose, to comply or explain. Uh, they're free to explain, you know, why they're not doing it. They don't face uh, lawsuits by regulators or by their beneficiaries if they don't do it, or even if they don't comply or explain. Um, so, you know, it, it's a pretty light touch. And at the end of the day, um, I think the jury is still out on how effective these stewardship codes are. I mean, you know, yes, there's a whole movement to to do this all around the world. And you know, sometimes they have a little teeth, sometimes it's at the level of a stock exchange as part of its listing requirements. Um, but I don't think they are nearly as dramatic as the kind of obligations that we tend to talk about in the United States. That's great, thank you so much. And I know that we have actually one of the panelists is with us, uh, Josh Mitz. Josh, I know that you have a question. Hey Jill, uh, just to, I wanted to follow up kind of on, on the direction that Anat was going, which in, 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 in really towards the tail end of your answer, which is the, the distinction between um, ex post liability and uh, a regulatory burden of some sort. I guess it's really the, what's the, what's the right institutional mechanism for stewardship? Um, is it you know, is it liability? Do we think the courts are good at some parts of this, but not others? Do we think that that this is really a in division of investment management problem? Uh, it just where do we situate it? Which institution is best suited uh, to, to impose these duties or to make these judgments? <laughs> Muting and unmuting myself. So um, a good question. And I get, I mean, you know, I'm going to push back because it's not really clear to me that it should be courts or the SEC or the Department of Labor. You know, I don't, I don't really, I guess I'm too much of a fan of markets as at least being the sort of first order solution to this problem. And if it's a problem. And I think that what we see going on in the mutual fund market right now it's a tremendous amount of change and a tremendous amount of innovation. I mean, if you look at the number of funds that are devoted to stewardship in one form or another, 
And it could be, as I said, it could be through stock selection. It could be through engagement. It could be traditional funds increasing the type or the level of engagement. It could be impact funds, right? There's a whole universe of stuff going on. And even at the same fund complex, what they're offering and what they're disclosing about what they're doing is changing dramatically. Um, I mean, uh, uh, Vanguard just changed the type of disclosures that it's making about its funds voting records and created a whole system in which all of a sudden it's accessible. You don't have to go download all the NPXs and sort through all of the different votes. You can get the information. I own this fund. I care about this annual meeting. How did my fund vote? Right. So, you know, what that is, is a market enhancing tool. And I would see how that plays out before I asked regulators to step in and kind of freeze the frame because regulators don't always get it right. Thank you so much, Josh and Jill. And I have two more questions from the audience. I'll just read those two questions to you. One is uh, from Christopher Switzer. Is there a current mechanism in US law to regulate this? Maybe something like best practices in the FTC or would a whole new law be required? And we have another question from Catherine Williams. Given that these are highly used by mutual funds and casual investors, do you think that this level of regulation is sufficient, particularly given that the least sophisticated investors are the most vulnerable? Well, so I guess it's not entirely clear to me what both of the questioners means by regulation. Um, I mean, under existing, um, under the uh, Investment Advisors Act, under the Investment Company Act, fund managers are fiduciaries to their funds. We're not, I think, entirely clear on what that means. So a lot of the debate right now is whether as a fiduciary, you are required to focus solely on economic value. Is it short-term economic value? Is it economic value that you can prove with some sort of you know, uh, empirical research? Can you take non-pecuniary considerations into account? And what's the relationship between economic and so-called non-pecuniary? And those are all spaces on which commentators, you know, debate. I, I, you know, I don't think we know as academics or as a society entirely what the right answer is. So I don't think the sort of body of existing regulation has even developed to try to answer those questions, and I'm not sure it should. Right. So you know, the Department of Labor just released something for pension funds, essentially warning them about the risks and the need to justify any kind of um, investment on so-called ESG considerations in economic terms. The status of the research in this area is very mixed. I mean, there's research out there suggesting that taking ESG into account is correlated with better economic performance. And there's research suggesting the contrary. So I'm not sure as a fiduciary what a pension fund manager is supposed to do. And that's why I'm hesitant to try to freeze the frame and say, okay, now I want the SEC through this notice and comment process or Congress or somebody else to weigh in. I would, you know, I, I think this is a space in which we have tools. Um, you know, the market is a pretty powerful um, uh, uh, force in the investment area. If investment managers get it dramatically wrong, we don't really need fiduciary duty litigation, right? Money has power. With that, thank you so much, Professor Fish. This was amazing, thank you. And uh, we're going to move on to the next presentation, uh, Professor Lipton. So uh, as I noted before, Professor Lipton, uh, is joining us from Tulane uh, Law School. And again, as I noted, uh, follow her blog and her Twitter account. It's very, very interesting. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, uh, and thanks so much for letting me take part in this symposium. I'm really excited uh, to have this discussion and I'm grateful uh, for the invitation. Um, 
So in my presentation, I'm going to focus on the choice between competition and cooperation in mutual funds and mutual fund families. Um, the title of this panel is Fiduciary Obligations of Index Funds Managers. So I'll start by unpacking the concept of index funds and the concept of fiduciary duties. And some of this was actually already flagged um, by Jill. So I'll be going over a bit of the same territory, but I think I have a slightly different take on it. So uh, when we say index funds, we usually think about the S&P 500 and other broad ind indexes. Um, and the reason we treat index funds as a category, the reason we talk about them as a thing, is because we tend to assume they're broadly diversified, they're stuck following the index, which means they have to make long-term investments in their companies. And there are certain implications of that. We expect they might be more interested in stewardship than active funds because they can't sell. We expect that because they are broadly diversified, they want to see the economy as a whole perform well rather than focus on specific um, uh, corporate interests. Uh, the problem is index funds are actually a much broader category than that. So yeah, there's a terrific amount of money that's chasing general market indexes like the S&P 500 and Russell 2000 and so forth. But at the same time, and I'm sure at least some of you are familiar with Adriana Robertson's work on this, a lot of indexes are very idiosyncratic, often commissioned by a particular fund sponsor and followed by only one fund. These are called index funds, but they really represent a type of active management with a sort of limited churn. So there are energy index funds that have oil and gas. There are clean energy index funds that focus on solar. There are sustainability index funds. There's the State Street Gender Diversity Index Fund. And that's actually what my Zoom background is referring to. What you're looking at are the performances of comparative performances of four different ETFs, all of which focus on gender diversity, and three of which call themselves index funds. Um, and like all indexes, including the broader indexes, these um, uh, indexes are amended sometimes multiple times in a year, which means the fund has to buy and sell to match the reconstituted index. And the modifications may be at the request of the funds that follow the index. So they have input into index selection. The big three fund families, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, they dominate the mutual fund space. Um, uh, my numbers are probably a little bit about it, out of date, but the last statistics I have are that BlackRock owns at least 5% of half of, uh, 5 of half of publicly listed companies. Vanguard has at least 5% and 40% of publicly listed companies. And if you take the holdings of the big three together, those three have the largest single block of stock and something like 88% of the S&P 500 and so forth. And these giant mutual fund complexes are mostly known for their index funds. Um, and it's assumed that due to their large stakes and broad diversification, they should be good corporate stewards. But they, along with the smaller complexes, also sell a lot of these niche funds, which means a lot of the funds offered by our classic passive giants actually have very specific types of investment strategies. So when the indexers are creating these specialized index funds that have an obvious investment theory behind them, it's hard to say that the funds own the economy. The family as a whole owns the economy, not the individual funds. Meanwhile, we know that an awful lot of nominally active funds basically just track an index with some minor modifications. And that means we may not want to draw really sharp distinctions between the big three and the other large complexes like Fidelity or T. Rowe Price. Um, that uh, focus mostly on active funds. The big three may be broadly diversified across the entire family, but many of the funds have really idiosyncratic investment strategies, and they aren't necessarily all that tied to a single set of stocks. Okay, so that's the index funds part of this panel. What about the fiduciary duties? Fiduciary duties are state-imposed obligations. They're imposed on certain relationships. When people form a relationship, an agency relationship, whatever it is, the law imposes obligations on the parties um, to act in their best interest, to act solely to advance their interests, whatever it is. And the state imposes these obligations as a matter of policy because they think the world is better that way. But we also know in real life, fiduciary obligations aren't really self-executing. You need to create a set of incentives that induce the fiduciary to act in that way. So at bottom, this is about the government to determ determining what kind of policies it wants to advance and then designing a regulatory ecosystem that will create the right incentives. So when it comes to corporations, for example, managers have fiduciary duties to shareholders. And there are a lot of arguments about why that's good as a policy matter, why we want that. But to make sure that managers actually live up to their fiduciary duties to shareholders, we have a mix of regulatory incentives coupled with governance powers. We give shareholders various types of governments right, governance rights, and then we make it easier or harder for them to exercise those rights with market regulation, disclosure obligations, um, and so forth. 
I think in the mutual fund space, the fiduciary duties we have and the regulatory system surrounding it are suboptimal from the point of view of the actual fund investor, especially the retail fund investor. And the reason for that it's partially all the reasons regulatory choices may be suboptimal. Maybe there's regulatory capture. You have powerful business interests that lobby one way or another. But I think it's also because there are conflicting policy interests at stake. First problem, I think we have too many funds. Um, for retail investors in particular, there shouldn't be that many much variation. This is well understood. Sure, we can say everyone's a special snowflake and there are dis different risk tolerances and different goals. But for most retail investors, they're saving for retirement and they should be invested in a broad, safe, cheap, passive index fund of some kind. They do not need all of these options. But retail investors end up buying expensive index funds, even when virtually identical ones exist elsewhere, or they buy a fund that's cheaper or they buy a fund that's got some kind of strategy, whether it's an active fund or a niche index that underperforms. We have a lot of competing ETFs that are literally identical, except for the fees. And the more of them they are, the worse the liquidity gets for all of them, um, making it more expensive to trade. There should be market pressure to cure some of these pathologies, but there isn't, and we know why. Um, the ETFs thing is its own particular problem, but with a lot of the problem here is that retail investors are relatively unsophisticated. They don't understand fees or returns or how to evaluate funds, even when they're instructed about it, and so they make a lot of bad choices. This is fixable. We could have stronger fiduciary duties for the funds themselves, backed by incentives, of course, but we could have regulatory interventions or private rights of actions or whatever that require, that re require funds to offer better fee structures regarding the value add of uh, introducing a new fund that's identical to an old fund, regarding disclosure of the fact that there's an identical fund somewhere else. We don't do that. Instead, the fiduciary obligations have, as a practical matter, been pushed down from the fund to the sales channels, to the brokers, to the registered investment advisor to the ERISA plans. And of course, those obligations are very, very weak. And there's a lot that's allowed in terms of compensating brokers to sell certain funds to retail investors, even when those are not the optimal choices. Point being, there's less market discipline in this space than there should be. If the funds really had markets to discipline them or regulatory obligations to discipline them, um, there would be a lot less competition than there actually is. So not long ago, the Obama administration, and I will take a pause to for fond remembrances, um, the Obama administration proposed stronger fiduciary obligations for brokers, and all the brokers objected because they said it would force them to sell only passive index funds, to which I say, Yes, good, what else would you do? That's what a retail investor needs. If we had real market competition, a lot of funds and a lot of fund complexes wouldn't exist anymore. I mean, to some extent that's obviously happening. It's why we're talking about the big three and not the big 15, but there's been consolidation in a lot of industries. And the fact that the big three are branching out into these niche little index funds tells you it's not just about investors getting smart about passive versus active. So William Bird Thistle, he's a big mutual fund theorist. He literally wants all 401k money to be pushed into a very small set of funds administered by one asset manager, BlackRock. Quinn Curtis, also a big fund guy. He wants everyone to be in a passive target date fund because of course that's where the vast majority of the market should be. We could make that happen. We could design a regulatory system that encourages putting retail investors in those kinds of funds. But that is scary. It's great for mutual fund investors, but it has problematic macro effects. One of those effects is the concern about passive index funds taking over the markets to the point where markets become less informationally efficient. People have been sounding the alarm about that for years. Another concern is about the actual power and influence of mutual fund complexes. We have a lot of suspicion about concentrated economic power and particularly the governance implication if, implications if one asset manager controls all the corporations. We um, also might have concerns about the power of index providers. When we're talking about broad market indexes, there are really only a couple of operators in this space and they have tremendous regulatory power. They control how governments regulate their securities markets in their, because they want to make sure that their home companies can be included in indexes. So giving them even more control of the market is a little scary. So we have serious tension between what is optimal for fund investors and what's optimal for markets and the economy as a whole. Um, okay. So uh, we have a, a too many funds problem, which I think is at least partially traceable to a lack of fiduciary obligations and corresponding regulatory regime, which itself is due to a set of confused policy goals. 
We also have a parallel set of problems when we look specifically at fund stewardship and how mutual fund companies conduct oversight of their portfolio companies. So the problem in corporate governance has always been if managers are supposed to advance shareholder interests, how do we make that happen? It's hard to do by increasing shareholder power and giving them more governance tools if the shareholder base is fragmented. Shareholders with a very small stake can't influence the corporation much and it's not worth it for them to try. In recent years, we've had the rise of institutional investors, especially in mutual funds. More and more shares are held by institutions rather than natural persons, and that seems to present a solution to our rationally passive investor problem. Institutional investors have vast holdings under professional management, and so it's been assumed they really have the skills and incentives to oversee corporate behavior and control corporate managers. But that's, of course, only part of the truth because the marketplace is fragmented. It's not all one fund. When you go fund by fund, they each hold a tiny sliver of the market, more than what a human would own, but not enough to put in the kind of oversight that a lot of theorists seem to want. So now the argument is funds should cooperate rather than compete. Well, how do we make that happen? On the most basic level, we have proxy advisors, ISS Glass-Lewis. These companies are in the business of analyzing matters that are coming up for a shareholder vote, and they make recommendations to institutional clients about how to vote their shares, and they can tailor recommendations to the clients, so the clients have particular prices, if the clients have particular types of preferences, and that's one way we can coordinate among institutions, including, but not limited to, mutual funds. The other way we get coordination has to do with how fund families operate. So the reality is that fund families tend to centralize their votes across all the funds they have. They might give the individual portfolio managers more or less freedom to depart from the house view, but some uh, families are very strict about requiring everyone to vote the same way. And I should also say that complexes like Vanguard and Fidelity, which offer both active and passive funds, have developed separate voting systems for the passive and the actives, which is essentially for regulatory reasons. They'll they're, they're afraid they'll be regulated like activists if the active side votes with the passive. But they're still treating things as a group, um, the passives separately from the actives. And for me, this is an issue because I think when you go fund by fund, the interests of each fund are not always identical. And if the fund families centralize their governance and treat all funds as a collective, they may be harming the interests of individual funds. And I've been on this jag before. Many of you I know have heard me talk about this, but like if the fund family has bond funds and stock funds, the family as a whole might find it profitable to minimize risk across the family, which maximizes the fees to the family, even though the stock funds might prefer more risk that ends up damaging the bond funds. We might have the common ownership problem. That's going to be addressed in another panel, but um, there are a lot of concerns about mutual fund families that own stock in different competing firms like airlines, and they may cause their portfolio companies to collude to raise rates to lower customer service because they're broadly invested in the industry and not any one airline company. Now, that might very well present antitrust problems, so I'm not saying it's a good thing for society, but as a theoretical matter, it's at least good for fund shareholders because it maximizes the value of the sector. The problem is fund families don't all have the stock, the same stock in all their funds. It's distributed differently. So the transportation fund might feel very differently about competition in the airline industry than the clean energy fund or the regular energy fund or the broad index fund. And the more you see these niche index funds, I think the more the differences are exacerbated. So that's why the big three of all these sustainability funds with really bad sustainability voting records, because they centralize their votes instead of considering the needs of each fund individually. Now, there may be reasons funds would want to cooperate with each other and not advance their interests individually for the same reasons you ever want to cooperate with someone. Votes are only valuable as a collective. The funds might, in some circumstances, think that cooperation is worth it, even if a particular vote or engagement is suboptimal for a particular fund at a particular time. But it's not obvious that's always true or when it's going to be true. So now we have to decide what are going to be the fiduciary obligations that mutual fund companies owe to fund investors when they engage in stewardship activities. And the regulatory framework should follow that sense of what the obligation should look like. This is a policy choice, and there are different options. Here's one set of arguments. We want families to treat their holdings as a single portfolio because that's the only way their holdings and their profits are large enough to incentivize them to engage in stewardship at all. We want families to concentrate their economic power because it's the only way we solve this uh, shareholder collective action problem. We might even say we want families to make the decisions across the portfolio because now they, we really are looking at them owning the economy. They, they won't just be better corporate stewards, they'll be better economic stewards because they'll care about the externalities of individual companies. 
we want them to play that role. So in that um, uh, iteration, we don't want stewardship of the energy fund to be different from stewardship of the real estate fund, because the energy fund will externalize the cost of global warming onto the real estate fund, and that hurts society. So please, fund family, treat them all as one big portfolio, because that'll balance the economic interests that you have across the portfolio of all of society. And there's an argument, which I saw in another context, and I'll explain that context in a minute. We maybe want families to smooth out results across their funds to maximize wealth across the family, precisely because retail investors kind of suck at choosing funds. And if the funds practice general stewardship, then retail investors can't go all that wrong when they pick a fund within a family, which is ironic because um, if we want to protect retail investors, maybe we shouldn't have all the different funds in the first place. But okay. So now I have to add one odd little point on this, which is Vanguard. Vanguard is actually owned not by some set of profit-oriented shareholders, but by its own funds. The funds in the Vanguard complex actually own Vanguard. So you could say theoretically that all the Vanguard funds actually have an interest in Vanguard's performance overall, including the fees that Vanguard collects from each individual fund. So it really is one big portfolio. Every fund is interested in the performance of every other fund, and that's why they should coordinate. Except that's not exactly the case because Vanguard doesn't actually give the funds any rights to its earnings. So they're like shareholders, but name only. But it does present an interesting theoretical question. So these are arguments in favor of families centralizing their votes, but there are counter arguments. Most obviously, different investors are invested in different funds. And if we want to protect the actual for real human being investors, we have to take those different seriously. You should get the benefit of the fund you're invested in. Another argument, fear of concentrated economic power. If we don't like concentrated economic power, if that's part of the reason we don't force all retail investors into one big target date fund, if we're afraid of antitrust problems from common ownership, the absolute simplest thing in the world is to emphasize that fiduciary obligations run to the funds individually and then regulate to force the families to operate that way. And there are a lot of nuanced choices here. If we just want to essentially hobble the economic power of the largest complexes without entirely undermining them, we can just throw up regulatory barriers in the way of fund coordination, like a documentation or compliance requirement, something like that, to show that the co consideration was given to whether the fund should cooperate or defect. That might induce enough friction to mute their power without entirely eliminating it. One of the really interesting developments here has been the regulatory attacks on proxy advisors and on the 14A8 proposal process. That's a subject with a lot of angles, but I think the very short version is these attacks are meant to undermine shareholders' ability to coordinate with each other. If proxy advisors can't operate freely, it makes it much harder for shareholders to reach a coherent set of preferences that can actually have an impact on corporate behavior. 14A8 as well, it's another mechanism for shareholders to coordinate with each other and express a set of preferences about how corporations should be run. So rule 14A8 allows shareholders at particular companies to put a proposal on the corporate proxy for other shareholders to vote on. They're used to express preferences about governance arrangements like staggered boards or proxy access and to express preferences about social and environmental issues like climate change or diversity reporting. 14A8 proposals are influential, not just at the targeted corporation, but also at a wide swath of companies because shareholder support for a proposal can help establish industry standards. But the SEC just dramatically restricted 14A8 and pulled back from major reform of proxy advisor regulation in favor of more minor reform. But the point of all this is they want to fragment the shareholder base, make it harder for shareholders to cooperate. But there are unintended consequences there. The big three have very concentrated economic power. They don't need a proposal to make companies do what they want. They just need to make a phone call. They don't follow ISS lockstep. They reach their own conclusions. So if you make 14A8 proposals rarer, that just means the big three can operate free of public oversight. We have no idea what they're advocating for in terms of governance or sustainability or any other issue because we won't see their stewardship out in the open. They don't have to disclose voting policies on matters that never come up for a vote. And if you make it harder and more expensive for the proxy advisors to operate, it's not the big three that are going to lose power because they don't need the proxy advisors. The ones who will have trouble coordinating are the smaller shareholders, which just amplifies the voices of the big three. Upshot being, they will have more influence in the corporation, not less. And that matters if we're concerned about concentration of economic power, and it matters if we're concerned about how the big three are exercising their stewardship. With that said, I'm sorry, I know I'm running over time, but with that said, I don't have a great answer because I think this is really a question about policy, but I do have one thought, which is probably wrong, and I'm going to looking forward to somebody telling me why it's wrong. Okay, so one of the interesting things here is that mutual funds can only, their advisors can only collect uh, fees based on assets under management. They collect a, a percentage of assets 
It's under management, not performance fees. But the individual portfolio manager who actually runs a particular fund, they can get performance fees. And for active funds, they absolutely do. I don't know about index funds, but they're definitely getting for active funds. And what they what um, studies have found is that the performance based fees that go to the human portfolio managers who run the active funds either compensate them for outperformance of their fund alone or compensate them for performance based on the fund family entirely. They, they can do one or the other. And you will be shocked to learn, I am sure, that when compensation is based on fund alone, you have a great divergence in fund performance. Some performance are great, some funds are great, and some funds are poor. But when they are compensated based on the fund family as a whole, you have a really smooth performance across the family. And some have argued this is good for retail shareholders, again, because they get to they can choose uh, th that way they can't go very wrong if they pick a fund. Um, anyway, so the point is, can we import that into the index fund space? Can we say something like index fund, the individual portfolio manager should have the freedom to vote their shares as they want with all the resources and research departments of the centralized governance departments of their family, and they're compensated based on the performance of their fund. So then, then they'll have real um, incentives to decide what kind of stewardship is best for the fund and whether cooperating with other funds in the family is really the best way to go. Um, anyway, uh, that's all I got and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Lipton. This was amazing. And I uh, actually have um, a question, but also uh, first there's some questions um, from the panelists. I just wanna quickly remind people, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and Professor Rosenblum here, Darren Rosenblum, thank you so much. He's got a question here. So thank you so much, Anne, for that really interesting presentation. I learned so much. Um, and I really like <clears throat> the, the way in which you underscore the complex situation in which we sit, which is that um, there's clearly market failure going on because there's so many funds that overlap and there's so much um, sort of less than optimal governance going on. I guess the question that I had for you is whether you've read about other regulatory systems. I know you mentioned a few scholars who've suggested things, but outside the United States in which there are ways to resolve some of these concerns through the state, because I do suspect that within the US, there's such a reticence to having the state press its thumb on the scale that, that there's perhaps too little regulation as, as opposed to the sort of Goldilocks level. And I was just wondering whether you encountered anything in, along those lines in, in what you've read. Thank so, you. Yeah, I mean, I have, I mean, the fact is that I'm just not like, I, I tend like the United States is overwhelming enough. I don't focus too much, on, not because it's, because it's just, there's only too much, but I know a little bit. I mean, cause you know, generally with retirement, the, the idea is, um, you know, three pillars, there's the state pension, there's personal investments and there's employer pensions and different countries have, you know, systems that balance it more. And like part of maybe what's throwing this out of whack is when I say everyone should be in a target date fund, or maybe we should just have stronger social security and pension benefits and then, it's fine to give more freedom to like, you know, go play in the other spaces. And that may ultimately be the cause of the regulatory failure here. That's, I think that's the right answer is that part of the reason we, this matters so much is because the, the state pension sector has shrunk so significantly. Um, but thank you. Professor Fish is also here with us. Do you have a question for Anne? Yes, Anne. So uh, good morning and wow. Um, the, that was like warp speed and I have about 6 million questions. Um, but I want to take you back to something very simple because I made the world kind of complex when I started talking about ESG and engagement and voting. And of course, you've got your great background with thematic funds and so forth. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated world out there. But you took us back to the kind of straightforward issue of returns and risk and fees. And you know, obviously a lot of the debate about fiduciary duties is about those very straightforward questions. 
but I'm curious about your sort of confidence that in the current environment, the best thing for every investor or the vast majority of investors is a low cost target date fund. Because, you know, I see the market responding to investors saying, no, that's not the best thing. I mean, number one, right, there's this whole debate about fees. I'm not sure that the race to zero is ideal. I mean, you get a certain package that you talked about a lot with the race to zero. You know, I'm not sure if that's best for investors or for the state of the world. Number two, there are a lot of not just funds, but fund complexes out there that are promoting what looks to me like a really different product, like Calvert, right? Calvert's not the big three. And you buy a Calvert fund and you pay somewhat more, right? What you get is not just a socially responsible fund, but a whole fund complex that has a different view of what investing should be about. Why can't an investor buy into that? And then if Calvert does that, why can't BlackRock or Vanguard say, you know, Calvert's got something here that people want. We're going to create some funds other than our target date fund or our S&P 500 index fund to try to tap into what people want. And yes, you know, I agree we have too many funds, but I'm not sure that we should be driving to zero. And right now, given sort of the diversity of viewpoints about what funds should do, I kind of think more might be better than it was, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. I, I, I guess I, my view is there's the, like the happy medium sort of thing. Like, I think there are too many funds, but that doesn't mean I want to get rid of Calvert. I think Calvert is a luxury product. Um, I think that, uh, I think that um, you can't trust, well, this is what the market demands if you can't trust the market demand. And I don't think you can trust the market demand for a good chunk of it, not all of it, but a good chunk of it. And the reason you can't is because we can't trust that retail investors know what they're doing, which is a big chunk of it. That doesn't mean like there's no room for sustainability funds or ESG funds. And I am all in favor of ESG funds that are openly saying, you know what, we're not going to invest in oil. And I don't care if oil is profitable. We're just not going to do it because we think that's bad or, you know, something along those lines. As long as that's clear to, I mean, because I, if one of the interesting things here is that I think when you talk to like retail investors and what they can and can't understand, the thing that they can understand probably the most readily is you will not have the highest returns, but you will not be inv invested in oil or private prisons or whatever it is. Like if there's any one thing I actually trust that retail investors can understand, it's that one thing. Um, but that's not the only space here where there's like too much variation. And then, so so that, so that one problem we have is the, the, no, this is the best for you financially and it really, really isn't kind of situations. And also the issue of funds that say they're ESG funds or sustainability funds, but they're very unclear. And you, as you said before, they're very unclear on exactly what that means and sustainability, but like in name only, and it's just a sort of greenwashing thing. So I think that, um, there are too many funds because the channels by which they're sold, because partially because of retail investor lack of understanding and a lack of supportive channels that will help them sort of narrow it down. Doesn't mean get rid of Calvert, but you know, we can do with less than four gender diversity index funds, which I don't even know what that even means. Which Thank, is you so <laughs> Thank you so much. And I actually have uh, one more question from the audience. Um, and they're stating that both panelists have talked about investment complexity and the lack of financial literacy. Is there any role for increasing uh, financial literacy in fixing these issues? Would it help your average mom and pop investor to care about uh, these issues? Um, is increased literacy even achievable? Um, everybody has different takes on this. My view is absolutely not. Because I remember back when, um, okay, so like the story that I like to tell, I can tell this story, I know a zillion people, is that I am a business law professor. I teach business law for a living. I started at Tulane and I knew that after like a year or however long it is, my retirement plan would kick in. And I put a note to myself, investigate your retirement plan. And then every time it popped up on the calendar, I pushed it ahead three months because I'm busy. I am not in the business of financial planning. I'm in the business of teaching about business law. And then finally, my salary starts going down. And I'm like, what the 
the hell happened? Oh, my retirement plan kicked in. And then I moved everything into the cheapest bond fund I could find because I don't like risk, which is absolutely not what you're supposed to do. And I know that. But the fact is that a professional retirement, a professional financial planner spends time on that and ordinary people don't. They once did like a survey of economists at like, I don't even know what like fancy school it was. And like 90% of them had their retirement plan in the default index, in the default fund for their plan for their 401k or their 403b or whatever. So like, no, I don't think. And that's the people who are supposed to know. So no, I don't think education is worth it. What you need is actual guidance by an actual person who has actual fiduciary obligations and an actual more limited menu of choices, at least for the basics. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of experimental work on financial literacy, and uh, I'm not convinced that it's as gloomy as Anne <laughs> suggests, um, in part because Anne's answer told you, look, there are things that she actually knows, and the fact that she chooses not to do them isn't because she doesn't know what they are, right? So, so two different things going on. Um, you know, I mean, there are lots of people who know they're not supposed to eat sugary donuts and still eat sugary donuts, right? That's not a lack of nutritional literacy. Um, but, but I think that, you know, I think there's a large population that doesn't know these things. I think there are ways to convey that information. And I think there are ways to make people better investors. And I think at the same time, Anne's right, um, there's a huge role for intermediaries to help. And those, inter you know, it's not just, Anne painted a sort of bad story about these incentivized brokers, but the most important intermediary for most of us in investing is our employer. Because our employer, number one, chooses, selects the funds that we have as options in our 401k plan. And that's true for us. And that's true for the cashier at Walmart. And that employer choice matters. The default option that the employer chooses matters tremendously because that's what most people pick. And if you ask them why, part of it is, well, I'm kind of lazy. And part of it is, well, I think my employer is looking out for my best interest. I think they know more than I do. I think they're doing a reasonably good job. I trust my employer, right? And we have, from a regulatory perspective, we paid absolutely no attention to employers and their role in mediating in this space. So I think that's tremendously important. And, and you talked about um, ESG funds not doing what they're supposed to do. That flags another intermediary, right? That flags the media. And you know what? The, the media isn't always reporting that information correctly. A lot of what people think about where to invest is based on what they read in the paper. And the media doesn't always get it right either. And the media has incentives for creating scandals and identifying greenwashing that, you know, are also a little bit suspect. So I think, you know, I think the story is, is a little bit more complicated than you suggest. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to move now to Professor Darren Rosenblum. Professor Rosenblum uh, joined the Pace Law faculty in 2004. Uh, where he teaches contracts, corporations, and international business transactions. He serves as the faculty director of the Institute uh, for uh, International and Commercial Law. His scholarship focuses on corporate governance, in particular on diversity initiatives and remedies for sex inequality. Previously, Professor Rosenblum clerked for the U.S. District Court of Puerto Rico and practiced international arbitration at Clifford Chance and Scadden Arps uh, Slate and Flom. Uh, professor Rosenblum has served as a visiting professor uh, at Science Po Law School uh, in Paris, uh, Brooklyn Law School, American University, and Seattle University. He presented his pioneering work on corporate board quotas in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, and um, he also served as, a, as the uh, Wainwright Fellow at the Faculty of Law at McGill University. He's actually joining McGill this uh, next year. And um, in uh, 2011, he was also a Fulbright Research Scholar in France and uh, performed a qualitative study on French quota for women on corporate boards, uh, which he presented at the French National Assembly. And I have to say it's a huge honor. He's a mentor and we're working on a project together uh, that you're uh, going to uh, hear about. Um, and uh, also with the Honorable Judge uh, Michal mongo Nam is gonna be joining us later on the panel of presenting that, that uh, project. So uh, without further ado, Darren, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Anat. And um, 
Uh, unfortunately, I was here for that intro, so I'm completely blushing. Um, uh, and I'm very excited to share this work with you. Hopefully you all see my screen, my PowerPoint. Is that visible to you? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so um, so uh, as, as you mentioned, Anat, uh, the three of us, you and uh, Nikola Gonen and I are working on a piece directly about fiduciary duties, which Nikola is going to present later today. Um, what I'm presenting now is more about a direction I'm going, which incorporates the fiduciary duty issue. And so this piece uh, called Legislating Corporate Diversity, New Directions, really tries to get at some of the core questions that are coming up with regard to diversity. So how are we regulating diversity? How might we start to regulate diversity differently now that it's becoming more commonplace? And then what are some of the problems with this? So let me... <clears throat> so my argument here is that as legislating diversity matures, variations on how much and which identities matter will drive legislative innovation. The way I'll present my talk is first starting with uh, a quick description of the quota revolution. Second, I'll talk about uh, some modifications to the quotas or more of these same quotas and some of the critiques of these quotas. Um, and then I'll move into the new directions, first exploring uh, directions that focus on more identity, such as the California statute that was recently put into place for uh, people of color and LGBT quota. <clears throat> and then I'll explore um, an opposite direction, which is less identity, including fiduciary duty, and term limits. Um, so the quota revolution, just to quickly summarize, and I think everybody is on the same page here, so I'm going to be very brief. But historically, initially, there were quotas for political contexts, um, eventually leading to over 100 political quotas around the world. Um, and that development gave the idea to Norwegian regulators to come up with a corporate board quota to integrate the private sector, which had still uh, reflected vast sex inequality, even though equality had been uh, reflected in the public sector. And so Norway's quota was passed in 03. It came into force in 08. And since 2008, that means to say in less than 12 years, we've seen a huge shift in global regulation of diversity, specifically sex diversity, in that um, a majority of the world's top 10 economies now have some sort of quota uh, for women on boards. Um, of course, um, while these um, quotas have succeeded in integrating boardrooms, there are still some important questions. Does this diversity help C-suite diversity, which is where diversity really matters? Um, Afra Sharipour is doing some interesting work here. Does it advance other kinds of diversity, such as that of people of color, LGBT, class, etc.? And most of all, at what cost? What are the costs of these quotas? Um, some of the critiques of quotas that have been floating out there um, uh, look at constitutional concerns. Joe Grunfest's critique of the California women's quota goes there. Um, a lot of um, arguments focus on, particularly here in the United States, the point that the state should really stay out of these business decisions as to who should do what within the corporate governance structure. There are arguments that are interesting on um, tokenism, that, and this, this often comes from the right, that basically it's insulting to women or people of color to say that they can only advance if they're the beneficiary of a quota. The flip side of that argument um, is coming more frequently from the left is the creamy layer critique, 
which basically says that the beneficiaries of identity quotas tend to be the most privileged people within a specific group. So we've seen this happen, particularly with regard to affirmative action. There's been a lot of literature on how uh, Caribbean Blacks it, get more advantages than African Americans, for example. And we see this in, in other quota contexts as well. There are other questions like why privilege this identity over that identity? And this has started to come up as California starts to regulate beyond gender. And then most importantly, I think, is the unspoken resistance. And this is unspoken because I think diversity has become a, a sort of civic religion among educated people within the United States in particular, but really more broadly. And so it's anathema to say, well, what are the costs that are posed by some of these remedies to people who have privilege? But I do think it's worthwhile to pose these questions. What are the costs to men? What are the costs to white people of these quotas? And to think about those costs as a rational um, effect that we see happen through this kind of regulation. Um, there are adaptations to quotas that have been adopted. Um, and I'm not including this in the new ideas because they're things that are already in place. Um, quotas with sunset provisions, such as Italy, quotas for one, the idea being that even just one person will bring substantial change, uh, such as India's quota, uh, again, Afra Afshari Poor has written about that, comply or explain regulation, which is the common law's answer, typically to um, state regulation. Uh, and then especially, and of most interest to us here in this conference, private solutions, private equity, and in particular, the ESG movement has really led a lot of efforts to integrate thinking about diversity, having diverse leadership. Funds have insisted on diverse leadership and made pushes in a variety of different ways. This is work that um, David Weber has, has pioneered and others have been looking into in very interesting ways. But I think it's worth noting that a lot of those efforts are in part at least to forego or forestall state intervention. And it's worth noting that purpose. Let's move on to the new directions. And this is where I'm adding some, hopefully adding some interesting ideas. So one direction is to think about more identity. Um, and so here, um, while sex quotas do tackle significant inequality, um, women are half the population and yet hold uh, less than 1% of the world's private property. Um, we can think about um, while there is a significant inequality tackled by these quotas, um, there is also the fact that a lot of women who benefit from these quotas are already quite privileged. And that's the resistance I often get to talking about quotas in feminist circles, that really you're talking about women of privilege, let's focus on people who are underprivileged. And so in fact, California focused now with its new quota on underrepresented populations. And by that, they mean people of color, which they define with a, a discrete uh, but long list of uh, different racial and ethnic minorities and LGBT folks who are also underrepresented according to uh, the statute. There's also, and there's really not regulation on this, but it's an important one to note, extraordinarily high levels of class um, exclusion going on. And that might be an interesting um, uh, avenue to explore. One example of that would be education. So for example, elites typically do provide their children with elite educations. And so one way around that might be to insist on diversity of educational backgrounds. Uh, but there are problems with more <laughs> identity regulation. And some of these critiques are things that I explored in a Forbes column I wrote about California's uh, new quota. 
um, including unintended consequences, um, uh, such as costs for men, such as um, uh, questions of self-identification. There are also limits to the intersectionality theory, which is driving a lot of this change. So in the decades since Kim Crenshaw published her groundbreaking work in the early 90s on intersectionality, people have thought a lot about how um, discrimination does affect people with multiple oppressions differently and more significantly. But you also sometimes come up with what's called a, a, by Nancy Ehrenreich at Denver, the infinite regress problem, the problem that you can keep going with different kinds of um, oppressions and how they affect different people. And it creates problems in terms of really coming up with coherent solutions for inequality. Self-identification issues come up with regard to race. We saw the recent controversy around the GW professor or the Rachel Dolezal um, situation. But we could easily imagine this as well in the LGBT context, um, where people can come out even though they might not be queer, or people could be pushed to come out when otherwise they might not want to come out because of the incentive created by the California quota. There's also the reality that certain identities are fluid. Um, and last, I'll note that the fact that diversity is agreed upon as a public value by so many of us does create some more doublespeak and reticence around frank conversation. Let's move on to the other avenue, which I personally think is more interesting and promising, uh, which is to think about less identity. Why do I think it's more promising? Because I think that the reservoir of resistance to quotas runs very deep um, and particularly among people who have privilege. Um, but also the resistance to tokenism is broader than we might think among uh, groups that might benefit from quotas. So what are the ways we can use less identity to get more diversity? One way is to impose a fiduciary duty on decision makers within the corporate sector, notably the board, to think about diversity in terms of their processes and uh, both in terms of leadership promotion for the CEO level, but also in terms of instituting structures within the firm that advance diversity throughout the firm. Um, the purpose of this, I think, in terms of the business goal is to avoid groupthink, which creates a, a plethora of bad decision making. And we can think of um, many, many examples, including the VW admission scandal, for example, in which companies that are run by a small group of like-minded and like-experienced people, typically white men, but they often also share a lot of other traits, including educational background and nationality, that the groupthink in which they engage is fundamentally harmful to good governance of firms. And so that the goal of good governance should be to use diversity as a tool to achieve better governance. One way to do this would be to adopt versions of the Rooney Rule. That is to say that every pool for every um, leader should include a diverse group of people. This would be a very soft way of diversification, but it would be nonetheless a step in the right direction. The idea here is, to, is for the board to think proactively about the value of diversity in order to advance good governance. Another direction, and this is something that I wrote about with Euron Neely uh, last year, is to use term limits to advance diversity. And so like with fiduciary duty, the goal is to improve governance. It recognizes that while imperial leaders might bring value, their presence also closes off new ways of thinking to the extent that experienced former CEOs populate a board, that means that new understandings 
will not be present in the room as discussions take place. Our research showed that incumbency correlates obviously with men because men are dominant in the corporate sector, but we also found that firms with lower average tenure also tended to have more women on the board. What that meant is that higher turnover created um, uh, higher sex diversity. And so that you could use term limits to get higher levels of diversity simply by forcing repeat games of hiring so that the increase in diversity in the pool actually filters up to the leadership level of the board and hopefully to the CEO. I will note that term limits are already in place in many other countries, and so this would not be a novel sort of regulation for the U.S. to adopt. Um, next, I'll move to another idea, which is hybrid quotas, and this is something I've not shared yet anywhere, and so I would very much welcome your, your feedback here. Um, the idea behind a hybrid quota is not to have a direct quota for uh, a particular identity, um, such as women or people of color, et cetera, et cetera, but rather to use term limits strategically to diversify the board. How could you do this? And this is really targeted at um, getting um, senior men or senior white people or senior white men off the board to create space for more diverse people. So the goal is not here to create a quota for the excluded individuals, putting the onus on those excluded individuals to join the power structure, but rather to say that people who already have too much presence on the board should face certain term limits. The way, the reason that I thought of this is in conversation with a corporate counsel at large companies, a lot of the concern that they voiced to me is that quotas uh, with regard to my term limits work uh, with your own was that these term limits ultimately sometimes force them or would force them to kick off some of the most experienced women who are leaders in their field, and, and that that was a real cost to the firm's effective governance. And so the idea behind this hybrid quota or hybrid term limit, which might be a more artful term, is to get at that particular phenomenon. All right, let me wrap up here. The success of quotas underscores how this tool, not took, sorry for the typo, how this tool can prove useful for broader issues. Indeed, California's laboratory uh, quota that it passed this year for POC and LGBT is a good example of that kind of experimentation with quotas. But there's still a lot of resistance to quotas coming both from the right and the left and a lot of undiscussed resistance to these quotas, which is worth taking into account um, to come up with new directions for regulating diversity. I've given you a few ideas for where that regulation might go, but I do want to underscore the role that private equity can and already does play, which is to think about state action and to proactively forestall that action by being more effective in their private sector governance efforts to foster diversity voluntarily. I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions uh, and hopefully um, hard critiques. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rosenblum. Uh, I just wanna quickly um, give people an opportunity to ask you a question. I also have a question for you. Um, I'm just reminding everybody, if you're um, one of the um, attendees, please send me a question in the Q&A. And if you are uh, panelists, uh, please raise your hand or uh, send me uh, a message on the chat. So I love your new idea. And I, so I have just like a, 
a few questions for you. And that is with regards to the term limit. So I think it's great. I think it's new. I've never heard that before. So that's um, definitely a great initiative. Um, so is there like a, are you thinking more of like a sunset provision and what's that term going to look like and how are they going to um, decide, um, you know, are there other things that should go, other factors that are going to take into um, effect here? Well, so I think that the, the basic idea behind, um, so first of all, I am an advocate of term limits generally without any identity component. Okay. Loan and my work both, uh, th that work I think is pretty solid. Um, and, it, <clears throat> and it comes from substantial literature, particularly coming out of political science that focuses on the ways in which incumbency is fundamentally linked to privileged populations. And who are those populations here? It tends to be white men. So while our research doesn't at all look at race, partly because we couldn't get the data, even with your own research budget, the data just isn't out there. Um, but I do suspect fundamentally that term limits would create uh, more racial and ethnic diversity. Uh, because I believe in this idea that, uh, that incumbency is fundamentally linked to a lack of diversity. Okay, so that's the first answer. I really believe in a non-identitarian term limit. That said, what I'm putting forth here as well, not instead of, but as well as, is a term limit that is focused on identity in specific contexts. The idea would be to put in term limits for, for example, men, so that um, effective organizations can keep their experienced diverse people and only push um, term limits on people who um, are in the majority, such as men or white people. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. This is this is great. Um, so I'd like to uh, move on quickly to our next speaker, uh, Bernard Charfman. Uh, Mr. Charfman is a senior corporate governance fellow at the Real Clear Foundation. He's a member of the Journal of Corporate Law's Editorial Advisory Board. He's the former chairman of Main Street Investors Coalition Advisory Council and a former visiting assistant professor of law at the University of Maryland and also here at Case, at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Uh, he's also a former associate fellow at R Street Institute. He's written extensively on corporate law and governance. His most recent uh, writing has included liberating uh, the market for corporate control with actually one of my friend, Mark Moore. I think it's great. Um, the risks and rewards uh, of shareholder voting, and now is the time to designate proxy advisors as fiduciaries under ERISA, uh, the undesirability of mandatory time-based sunsets and dual class share structure, a reply to also two friends of mine, Bebchuk and Castiel, mm -hmm. uh, enhancing uh, the value of shareholder voting recommendations, how the SEC can help mitigate proactive agency costs. Uh, and honestly, the list just goes on and on. He's a very prolific writer. Um, He's also written a number of common letters to the SEC, the Department of Labor, NASDAQ, and the New York Stock Exchange. And he has blogs uh, that uh, can be found on the Harvard uh, Law School's Forum on Corporate Governance and Columbia's uh, Blue Sky blog and Oxford and uh, Duke's. Um, I just want to also quickly tell the audience, this is a great opportunity to learn more about ERISA. So I'm very, very uh, interested mm -hmm. uh, to hear what you have to say. So thank, oh, thank, you. thank you very much, Anak. Very nice introduction. Let me see if I can get this up here. Okay, here's my PowerPoints. Can you hear me? Anak, can you hear me? Yes, sorry, oh, I good. muted myself. No yeah. problem. Okay, great. Okay. The uh, title of my presentation is The Conflict Between BlackRock's Shareholder Activism and ERISA's Fiduciary Duties. Uh, there is already a white paper out there on my SSRN uh, webpage. 
uh, author page. So if you want to take a look at that, you can. But I think it's going to be extensively revised for purpose of, purposes of the symposium uh, edition of the case, case law review. OK. Well, I think we all know that the, the big three, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, investment advisors to index funds, have an enormous amount of voting power and influence. OK. They also have uh, investment stewardship teams, the big three. Uh, this allows them to not just aggregate their voting power and influence across funds uh, for purposes of economies of scale and cost minimization, but also for purposes of coordinating their shareholder activism. And I'll define that in a couple of slides. Late night commercials are great, but wait, there's more. Uh, I love that when, when I'm watching TV late at night. There's also this potential for uncoordinated wolf packs to be created. And that's if the big two or more of the big three have matching uh, marketing objectives and engagement strategies. I won't be talking about that further, but it is something to, to think about. Okay, so how is this voting power created? Well, basically it's beneficial investors like you and me who are delegating uh, their voting authority to the mutual funds and exchange rate of funds that we invest in, who are then turning around and delegating this voting authority to their respective investment advisors. This is just standard industry practice, which has resulted, of course, in a concentrated voting power. Okay. One thing to note is that these investment advisors, even though they control all this voting power, don't have any economic interest in the underlying securities. So to me, this is just another form of empty voting. And this empty voting can create agency costs, as Gilson and Gordon would call them, the agency cost of agency capitalism. Okay. So in my paper, I focus on BlackRock's shareholder activism. Why do I focus on BlackRock? Well, They've, taken, they've definitely taken a leadership position in leveraging their delegated voting authority. How do they do that? Well, they do that through their shareholder activism. And I see shareholder activism as having three components. Rhetoric, uh, primarily through the Larry Fink letters to CEO and clients, where he discloses BlackRock's marketing objective and engagement strategy, BlackRock's shareholder voting, and their engagement with our portfolio companies. Okay, BlackRock's marketing objective. Well, what is it? Well, it's the marketing of its investment products to millennials. And I didn't realize that until I read this very fine article by Barzuza, Curtis and Weber, I think, David Weber, who I think may even be presenting this article today, I'm not sure. Um, and they foc they, their focus is to market to, to millennials because they understand that over the coming years, there's going to be a, be a huge wealth transfer, probably 24 to $30 trillion, give or take, from baby boomers and the silent generation to millennials. Okay, makes sense to start focusing on them now uh, so that they can have them uh, lined up when they actually hold the, hold the wealth. BlackRock also understands that millennials are a different type of investor group. According to BlackRock, millennials see the primary objective of business to be the improvement of society, not just generating profits. Okay. So how is BlackRock going to market to millennials? Well, basically, they're going to demonstrate that they have shared values. How are they going to do that? Well, they're going to do that through their share, shareholder activism, which, in my mind, is might sound cynical, is purely a marketing tool. Shareholder activism is going to help them maintain or expand their market share of the assets they have under management. They're also going to enhance their profitability by selling millennials ESG index funds that have relatively higher profit margins versus the standards like S&P 500 index. Okay. They also, I think, believe that millennials buy into the idea that they can do good, and that's BlackRock. They buy into the idea that, 
that millennials buy into the idea that they can do good by stock picking. I personally think this is kind of an absurd idea, but that is a topic for another discussion. Okay. Well, we're all lawyers here, right? So we're actually interested in the law and how the law you know, sees this shareholder activism. And my interest is the law of ERISA, Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And my initial question uh, in regard to ERISA is that, is there a fact pattern where the fiduciary duties of an ERISA plan manager require it to investigate BlackRock's shareholder activism. Now, I'm not talking about BlackRock's fiduciary duties under ERISA, because in general, there are none, okay? Unless BlackRock actually is managing a whole plan or part of a plan, it does not have fiduciary duties under ERISA, and so it gets a free pass on that, okay? So what I'm interested in is how plan managers' fiduciary duties interacts with BlackRock's shareholder activism and how it must uh, relate to it. Okay, so let's talk about ERISA's fiduciary duties. And it's very possible that, that most of you don't really know that much about it. I didn't know much about it until about a, about a year ago or so. And I pretty much learned everything I know, I know about uh, ERISA's fiduciary duties from a wonderful article by Schatzenbach and Sitkoff that appeared recently in the standard Stanford Law Review. Okay. First off, about the fiduciary duties under ERISA. Well, these fiduciary duties are actually written in the statute, unlike corporate law, um, and they're very explicit. They're also very strict. Okay. For example, the duty of loyalty, the primary one. A fiduciary shall discharge his duties solely in the interest of the participants and beneficiaries and for the exclusive purpose of providing financial benefits such as retirement income, okay? And let me be clear, the exclusive purpose does not allow for non-financial benefits. That's just the way the law is written in the statute, okay? Why, is it, why, did, why are these fiduciary duties in the statute so, so strict and so narrowly uh, focused? Well, basically it's congressional intent. If you're a textualist, you can ignore this, but I don't. Congress was obsessed with protecting plans from the financial harm that could happen from the opportunism that uh, plan managers could, uh, could uh, apply to the plan, okay? And this was generated, this, this congressional intent by uh, corruption of plan management that occurred back in the 50s and 60s, okay. There is also a duty of prudence, the plan manager's principal responsibility in selecting investments is to act with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence. So what you get here, of course, is the prudent person standard. It also requires an independent and adequate investigation when selecting investments. And the implication here uh, is, is uh, very nicely stated in a quote from the recent final DOL Department of Labor final rule on ESG investing under uh, ERISA, where it says the duty of prudence prevents a fiduciary from choosing an investment alternative that is financially less beneficial than reasonably available alternatives. Okay. Okay. So what is the fiduciary duties uh, that a plan manager must apply when it goes about its shareholder voting and engaging? Well, one thing is that plans directly hold equities, stock, voting stock, totaling around $2.1 trillion. Uh, if anyone has better numbers than that, that'd be great. That comes from a, uh, a recent DOL proposed rule. Uh, I'd like to see a breakdown on it, but I just haven't found anything. Um, so how are plan managers going to approach this voting and engagement? Well, again, ERISA strict fiduciary duties apply. And so basically it means that a plan manager's voting and engagement must be viewed purely through the lens of enhancing the financial retirement benefits of participants and beneficiaries. Okay. Now, finally, I come to the fact pattern that I really want to focus on. Okay. 
Well, okay, plan managers can hold stock directly, but it also has the option of investing in or making available, available to self-directed accounts, mutual funds and exchange traded funds. How much uh, plan managers hold now, I really don't know. Uh, if anyone has data on that, that'd be great, uh, especially equities. Uh, but in any event, if they do invest in mutual funds and exchange traded funds, the voting and engagement are now in the hands of investment advisors. They've delegated this away through this investment, okay? Now, it's interesting to note that this fact pattern was not covered in the Department of Labor's proposed rule on proxy voting. I thought this was a, a glaring omission. And so when I send in my comment letter, I told them you really should focus on this fact pattern. Uh, given that they're going to have to turn around things around really fast, I doubt they're going to do it, but well, who knows, we'll see. Okay. So the issue, under this critical fact pattern of plan managers investing in mutual funds and ETFs, does a plan manager, and let's say it's Black Rocks, does a plan manager have a fiduciary duty to investigate BlackRock shareholder activism. Okay. Well, I say yes. Okay, and I've come up with a rule, call it Bernie's rule if you like. Uh, a plan manager, as part of its investment selection process, now we're talking about mutual funds and ETFs, and general oversight function, has a fiduciary duty to investigate an investment advisor's shareholder activism. Okay, and I have two rationales for that. One is a duty of prudence rationale, basically for completeness of analysis. The activism is now part of the investment and a plan manager in its investment selection process really needs to assess that activism for its potential to harm or benefit the plan, okay? And there's also a duty of loyalty rationale and I'm, I'm still working on this one, but I would think a plan manager would want BlackRock's activism to be consistent with how a plan manager would have engaged or would have voted and engaged um, if it had retained its voting authority and had not delegated it away. Okay. So let's, let's take an example here. Let's investigate BlackRock's engagement strategy. And this is very, very interesting, uh, and, but they've been very public about it. Their strategy is a, one of benefiting various stakeholders who most appeal to millennials. Okay. Uh, stakeholders impacted who are going to be favored are going to be uh, impacted by climate change, gender equality, global supply change and operations impacted by COVID-19, and racial equity. Okay. How are they going to uh, enhance this uh, or in make sure their influence uh, is actually heard. Well, they're gonna to threaten to vote against management if they don't comply with their strategy. Okay, uh, this, um, this, is, this is basically all what I found just reading you know, Larry Fink's 2020 letter to CEOs. He pretty much laid it out. Okay, so when you look at this activism, it's not being done solely in the interest of participants and beneficiaries and for the exclusive purpose of providing financial benefits. Okay, that's pretty clear, okay? So it does violate uh, duty of loyalty, okay? Now, besides that, I think you should expect BlackRock's engagement strategy to actually reduce financial benefits to participants and uh, uh, and beneficiaries of a, an ERISA plan. Why is that? Well, BlackRock is extremely resource constrained. Okay, and I've been yelling and screaming about this for about the last year or two. No one's listened, but I'm, I'll say it again. This resource constraint has create, creates, in my mind anyways, a strong presumption of BlackRock being in, uninformed when it votes and engages. Okay, look at their investment stewardship team. It's actually, I think, the, still the largest of the big three. It's composed of approximately 45 professionals globally. Well, only 22 are based in the US. 12 of those have a global focus and 10 have a local focus. Of those 10 with a local focus, 
I'm pretty sure that includes not just the United States, but also Canada, which has pretty close to the same number of public companies as we do, I believe. In any event, I saw this quote recently, it sort of backs us all up about not being informed, where a BlackRock analyst was quoted as saying, I cover industrials and materials in the US and Canada. I cover approximately 800 companies in those sectors and I'm responsible for the engagement of proxy voting with those firms. Wow, that's, that's really amazing. Uh, you know, a, a good, I guess, security analyst will be covering 10 to 15 companies per year, maybe 20, I don't know. But, you know, compared to 800, wow. I mean, this 800 means, let's face it, this analyst is gonna be uninformed about any of, of the portfolio companies that it covers. That just, it just has to be, okay? All right. Moreover, BlackRock is really in the worst you know, possible position to interfere with stakeholder relationship. Well, why is that? Well, a uh, couple of reasons. But uh, primary one is actually uh, a quote from Charlie Corson. The whole philosophy of index investing is that it is unnecessary to know anything about the firms you invest in. And this is the same Charlie Corsmo, who I believe is seen to my West 360 miles away in Cleveland, attending this conference. That's a great quote. And it's very, very true. Thanks There's for the plug, Bernie. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, there's also been empirical confirmation of that as well. According to Bebchuk and Hearst, we reviewed all of the examples of behind the scenes engagements described in the big three stewardship reports. We found zero cases where engagement was described as being motivated by financial underperformance. This should not surprise anybody because they really are truly uninformed about their portfolio companies. Here's an example, okay. BlackRock's focus on global supply chains, okay. I think originally this focus on global supply chains by BlackRock, which preceded the pandemic, was really just signaling ethical values and nothing wrong with that. They wanted to signal their values that in regard to deforestation and inhumane working conditions, and perhaps the, the engagement went like this. We don't know what's specifically happening uh, at your company, but please consider, you know, these type of things. And that's fine, okay. But since the pandemic has occurred, there's been increased focus by BlackRock on uh, global supply chains. And I think it's basically simply, it, it, it's because it provides an opportunity to advocate for millennials. Well, why is that? Well, the global supply chains, if the pandemic has exposed weaknesses, well, a good way to, to deal with that is to make your supply chain less global and more domestic, okay? What would that do? Well, that's going to enhance employment opportunities for millennials. The group, the, the, the investor group that so far, or the demographic group that so far has really taken it on the chin financially versus everyone else, okay? In any event, whether that's true or not, I think it is though, where does BlackRock's expertise come from in weighing in on a company's global supply chains? It really has no expertise. So I think that's pretty scary, okay. So what's a plan manager to do? I would think after investigating this engagement strategy, it simply may decide to exclude, exclude BlackRock's index funds and seek out readily available alternatives, okay. But without the engagement strategy. Okay, final slide. So under ERISA, what kind of shareholder activism would actually meet a plan manager's fiduciary duties? What kind would actually enhance financial benefits? Well, I think it's when BlackRock's activism would mimic mimics the activities of hedge fund activists. I love hedge fund activists. I love the market for corporate control. Read my recent article, Liberty in the Market for Corporate Control of Mark Moore. Uh, anyways, uh, but you know, we, what a hedge fund activism does is that invest a huge amount of resources into financial analysis to become informed about a portfolio company, then it invests in more resources and coming up with a corporate strategy that would change, try to enhance shareholder value that they think would enhance shareholder value 
And then they go to the company and to their other shareholders and advocate for that change in corporate strategy. Okay. So that would, I think, is consistent with ERISA. Okay. And I think this approach would make Bebchuk and Hearst happy. Uh, their recent article, which I actually quoted on the previous slide, uh, that appeared in the Columbia Law Review, I think it's 2019. That's what that article really was all about in regard to investment advisors to index funds becoming super huge hedge fund, hedge fund activists. I still think it's a wild idea, uh, but, and I, it would take a, a, a major change in the business model of BlackRock or State Street or whoever to uh, actually you know, become that, but it is consistent with ERISA. So that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I learned a lot. And I just want to say a few quick things for the audience. First, uh, in five minutes, uh, my amazing colleague, Professor Kortzmoor, is going to continue uh, with another uh, panel. But if you'd like to stick around, please, I know we have uh, some questions for the panelists. Bernie, I have some questions for you. We also have some questions for uh, Darren. But uh, I actually wanted to start with Professor Weber. David Weber, I know you had a question for Bernie. Yes, hi. I did. Hello, hello. How are you? Not good. How are you? Good. Hey, Bernie. Hi, David. I feel so, Bernie. It's nice to uh, finally meet you. We've been exchanging on uh, LinkedIn and email for years, <laughs> and uh, I didn't make a slideshow. I am going to present that millennial paper. I didn't make slides, but I see I, I could just borrow yours uh, if I need them. Uh, <laughs> for today's talk, even though I, I, I appreciate the, uh, you know, I know you're using them, you use the paper for nefarious purposes. Yeah, but, of course. <laughs> but uh, but um, in any event, so a really interesting, really pr provocative paper. I actually did just want to push back a little bit on some of your claims or really actually on some of the Sonsenbach and Sitkoff claims about the exclusive benefit rule mm -hmm. under the U.S. Department of, of uh, uh, excuse me, under ERISA. Um, it feels churlish to say something like this, given that you've already put a few slides in about one paper, but I did want to direct you to another paper that I published a few years ago called The Use and Abuse of Labor's Capital, which was published in the NYU Law Review. And the reason that I mention it is not to say that this paper provides definitive proof that Sitkoff and Sonsenbach are wrong. It doesn't. But um, what I point to in that paper is a few cases that have a more capacious view of the exclusive benefit rule than the one that they present. So I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. Mm -hmm. There's an 11th Circuit opinion that I cite. I actually had the briefs from DOL dug out of the warehouse down in the 11th Circuit. But there was an 11th Circuit um, uh, uh, case, I believe it's called Donovan. I'll have to, I can oh, say yes. it yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that, sure. So in that case, what happened is a pension fund offered below market rate home loans mm -hmm. to, their, to their contributors, to their right. participants. And DOL sued saying you're not maximizing returns by definition in offering below market home loans. And they said that violates the exclusive uh, purpose rule and they lost. You know, the 11th circuit found that that was okay. And there's another case in California where the trustees agreed to, um, uh, lower, uh, uh, where the trustees agreed to lower contributions to the fund by the employer in exchange for the employer not firing workers. So there was a situation where trustees were took into account jobs in a way that hurt the fund, and that too was blessed. Mm -hmm. So my point is, I think that it's it's a narrow point, but I think it's an important one that the that the exclusive purpose rule, and there are cases that come out in favor of the Sazenbach Sitkoff interpretation, but the point is, I think it's still debatable about whether exclusive purpose requires that narrow focus on returns that that, that, that Stanford Law Review piece um, argues for. So, in any event, it's just a, it's a, it's a small point, but I think it does affect a little bit the analysis in terms of what kinds of things can be taken into account when thinking about these fiduciary duties. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, that was great, so thank you so much. 
uh, Bernie and I um, have just uh, another question actually from the audience, but that was for Darren. I don't know if Darren's with us and I believe that Professor Cosmos, uh, oh, Darren, you're here. Hey, how are you? I just have one question for you. Um, and that is, um, just a second, I'm just opening it up. Sorry. I, here, sorry. And that is, um, can any of these methods be discussed without allowing for decision-making best practices, otherwise new ideas from diverse people? Otherwise, diver new I ideas from diverse people, what, sorry? Can be ignored or they oh, can mm -hmm. behave like everybody else. Yeah, so this is a real, it's a real challenge. So I don't know if you remember, there was the slide in which I mentioned that some of the quotas are for one person, like India put in a quota for one woman on each board. And, and that quota did do some work, which is, um, uh that essentially it it makes the board no longer an all-male space um but it doesn't necessarily create a space for a voice coming from an excluded group and so the the notion of critical mass here is really essential coming from rosabeth moss canner the idea is basically that for it in any organization or decision-making body, there's gonna be a group of people who are um, more of the insiders. And for any of the outsiders to have a voice, they need to have about a third presence on the board. And so that's the that notion of critical mass is what underlies the reason that Norway went with a 40% quota and that all of the quotas or many of the quotas for women in particular have focused on the 40% number or Germany put it at 30%. Um, the idea of critical mass is that without enough people who are outsiders, their voice will be excluded. Now, the other question that's embedded in that question is not just the critical mass question, but also the question of co-optation. So if, for example, we think that an outsider joins the board and then they um, become part of the way the board operates, including its group think, then it does create the possibility that the new identities or the new diversity doesn't actually raise a new perspective in terms of the thinking. Um, and that is a genuine challenge. I will say, I think that's also likely an advantage of some quotas is that they create a rush of uh, a rapid increase of new members um, during which those people can develop their own voice that's independent from the established one on the board. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. This is great. Thank and you. I. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to th again thank my amazing panelists, uh, Darren and Bernie and Jill and Anne. Thank you for joining us today.